forward, if, if you will, you'll go forward with us. Exodus chapter 1. If you have your Bible with us, open to Exodus chapter 1. Got a little excitement this morning because we're starting a new series, the month of November, that we're calling Legacy Lessons. And I personally, she's excited about that. I'm, I'm personally, I think it is one of the best series that we do each year. I don't know how long we've been doing it. But every year, this is one of my favorites because, number one, it's about the lessons of life that have been passed down to you that have shaped who you are. Uh, at some point this morning in this process, you're going to think about some things that somebody taught you. You're going to think about somebody who took the time to correct you and somebody who took the time to maybe even discipline you or who cared about you enough to say, I know that you might want to do this, but let me just tell you that you don't need to do that. You need to do this. And, you may not have enjoyed it at the moment, but it was a lesson. It was a legacy lesson. And number two, I like it because I don't think we're doing as well as we should in doing that in this particular generation. We're, we are a distracted people. We are so distracted. We are so busy. We don't take time. We don't make time. And because of that, we are starting to not pass along those things that were given to us. And, and we are, listen to you all, we are just one generation away from losing all of that information. We are one generation, so if you're a parent or a grandparent, an elder, an uncle, an aunt, or however you progress that, there are lessons that have been given to you that need to be spoken to somebody. They need to hear that. If, even if they say, I don't want to hear you, you better sit yourself down. You need to hear this. You need to hear what has been given to me. Legacy lessons uh, are the convictions, the traditions, and the principles that shaped who you are. And are such a part of your life that there is a burning desire in you to pass them on to somebody else. You just want to pass it on. You just want to, it's made such a difference in my life, so I want to, I want to pass this along uh, to you and hoping that it will shape their life as well. And this morning, I get to start on this one. I want to talk to you this morning on the, the lesson of standing on a principle. I love that. Standing on a principle. Exodus chapter 1, start reading with me in verse 6. And Joseph died all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph, and he said to his people, look at this, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, verse 10, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and it happen in the event of war that they join our enemies and fight against us and so go up out of the land. Therefore, verse 11, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities of Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, somebody ought to highlight this in your Bible. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar, in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Verse 15, then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives. And here is where we are focusing this morning. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra and the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. You read that right. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. That was not true, but it was what they went with. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty, and it's still not finished yet. And so it was, because the midwives feared God, that He provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save. Long before it was called genocide, 
it was written into the word in that moment. Thomas Jefferson once said that in moments of style, swim with the current, but on moments of principle, stand like a rock. Hebrew Ward Beecher said, expedients are for the moment, but principles are for the ages. What you do in the moment can be expedient, and it's just a moment that it passes by, but principles are for the ages. When you live by principles, those are the things that don't just flash and splash and they're gone, but they are for the ages. So this morning I want to speak to you today about standing on a principle. And I'm praying that it's a lesson not only for you, but we'll go beyond here and you'll pass it along to someone else this morning. Let's pray. Father, give us the tongue of a ready writer this morning and let me speak your word. Father, I pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to respond. Lives are in the balance and let this morning be a day when destinies are changed. And I thank you for it. And they said together, amen. amen. <clears throat> I thought hard about this, how to begin this. And I finally settled on this that I would do it maybe against my, my better judgment. Uh, but I decided to be a little bit transparent with you and tell you that when I was a young man, uh, I was the ultimate definition of a crowd follower. Uh, maybe you can identify, maybe you can relate with that. But I was the ultimate definition of a crowd follower in every sense of the word. All the time, anytime, every time, no matter what, no matter what the challenge, no matter what the event, no matter what the moment, no matter what the temptation, someone would bring something up and little boy Cochran was the first one to say, well, well, let's just do that. That sounds like fun, no matter what. And it didn't matter in that moment when it was brought up what it was. It didn't matter uh, how it was going to affect me in the moment or negatively beyond that. I, I just was like the guy that said, I was that friend that a lot of people like to have. Where you just bring something up and that friend says, well, let's go get this done. And that, that was me. Last week I started thinking about that a lot. And, and I had two very odd things happened to me, first of all, is that I had a, a very, a lot of introspective moments last week. Uh, I'm 58, December I'll be 59, and you would think that you would already processed a lot of that information, but at 58 I was still processing that, and I had a lot of those moments where you look at yourself, you look at your own soul in the mirror and say, are, are you kidding me? Are you, that's not possible that you could have possibly at any time in your life been like that, and yet I was. But secondly, and most importantly than that, is that I asked the Holy Spirit to help me pinpoint exactly when it was that that changed in my life. Exactly when that was, that that was broken off of me and it's never been a problem since then. And he did, and at some point this morning at the, at the end of this thing, I want to share it with you because it's, it's pretty powerful. I remember the first time I ever stole anything. Um, in my house, uh, stealing was anathema, my my family, my parents, and, and beyond were like just really against all of that. And I remember the first time I stole something. They're all over the place right now, but I remember the very first little handy way that came to Crescent Beach, where I lived in Crescent Beach. There was nothing. There were no stores. There was nothing. And the closest thing that we had was a little store down the, the corner from us called Manwell's. It was run by an old man and an old, old woman, and it wasn't really a store. It was like a hotel, a small cottages, that kind of thing. And they had a, a little counter there, and they sold some stuff from behind the counter. It was all behind a little glass case, and so you had to walk in there and, you know, ask them, I, I want a Red Hot, or I want a Chicka Sticks, or a Neko, or whatever it was that you bought. And then you had to give them the money, and they handed you. But a handyway came to Crescent Beach. And, boy, when you were a little kid and you walked into a handyway, it just kind of blew your mind because it was, it was huge. It was like, oh, wow, there was so much. There's like seven aisles in the whole store, and it was all right there, and you could browse the, uh, everything. Well, it wasn't long before somebody floated the idea of stealing it. You know, and it went, why are we paying for this? You know, we should just, she's busy at the, the, the counter. She's not going to see you. So somebody said, just when you go in there, just take whatever you, whatever you want. And, and so I remember the first time I did that. I stole a pack of gum. And I, I, I slipped it in my pocket, and I, you know, I got in the car with Dad, and we were driving home, and me being the genius mastermind that I was, I pulled the gum out and opened it up and started chewing gum. <laughs> well, my dad looked over at me and said, son, where'd you get that? And I said, I got it from the handy way. He said, how much did you pay for it? I knew right then and there, the life of crime was not for me, <laughs> because I was, <laughs> I, I was not good at it. It was a bad night, just take it at that. I remember the first time that I skipped school. I don't know if it's a big deal anymore. Uh, maybe it is. I know it's a lot harder now to skip school than it used to be, but 
Back in my day, skipping school was a pretty big deal. And when I got to middle school, we went to Ketterlinas Middle School downtown. And which, being downtown was such a, an appealing thing because everything was close. And so the temptation was to get out of the... Uh, get out of the bus and slip through school and then go right out the back door and go downtown and just browse all day and walk around downtown and do all that. And that's, that's what we did. And so in the eighth grade, I missed an awful lot of school because we just didn't go to class. We just got off the bus and went downtown. Well, one morning, three of us, um, one, three of us skipped school and it was freezing cold. It was, I don't know who's stupid enough to skip school when it's freezing cold. But we went out and we, we skipped school and we got so cold that we, somebody came up with the idea of, well, let's make a fire. So we, you know, we won't be cold. So we sneaked into somebody's garage and we stole a, a container of gas and we went behind, a, of all places, a church. And we got a few little sticks together and we threw it on the ground and we threw the gas on it, whoop, you know, lit it up. And we're sitting there like Grizzly Adams around the fire, just warming up, you know, thinking that we were wonderful. And somebody looked up and there were three city cop cars parked and three city cops coming at us. Well, me being the, the rabbit that I was, I took off. I don't know what the other boys did. I didn't have to outrun the cops. I just had to outrun them. And so I took off. And well, a long story short, I got caught and, and it, was, it was a mess. If, if you wanted to steal, I would literally say, okay, let's do it. If you wanted to lie or cheat or drink, it didn't matter what it was, there, there's, I was thinking about it, there just didn't seem to be anything that I would not do. Which was so strange because I was not raised like that. I, I was not, you have to understand this, I know people get tired of hearing it, but if ever there were two perfect parents on the face of this earth, it was my mom and it was my dad. Those of you that ever met them and ever know them knew that, that they were, they were God-fearing, Jesus-loving people who, who stood on what was right. And, and their, ba their baby boy just went along with anything that anybody came up with to do. And I'm going to throw this in there because it needs to be said that if you're worried about that, and somebody might be, if you're worried about that right now because you have a child or children that are starting to to take off down that road and they're starting to walk and maybe a child or a grandchild that's going that way. Listen to this from somebody who walked this out. Listen, watch this, watch this. Don't worry about it. Pray about it. And you, should, you shouldn't take that as a cliche. You should write that down. Don't worry about it. Pray about it because the devil is so good at causing you to get your stomach all tied up in knots about it. You, you're worried about it and you're fretting and you're trying to control them and you're trying to control the situation and the devil has got you thinking that here they go. Here, and they're doing all this and they're going to end up on death row. They're going to be murderers and serial killers and all of this. Don't do that. The reality of my life is that I had praying parents. And so two things were absolutely set in stone. Number one, that no matter what I ever did, I got caught. I don't know if it was the Holy Ghost or, or it was just me, me being stupid. I got... Okay. Okay. You just worked your way into the 11 o'clock service. <laughs> but number one, I got caught. But number two, no matter how far I went, I could never go too far because I knew that they were on their knees praying for me. And so I'm going to just throw this in there. If your child or children is starting to walk down those roads, before you, before you make the mistake of just giving yourself a nervous breakdown, here is God's word for you in this moment. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Don't talk to your friends about it. Don't whine or cry about it. Talk to God about it. Pray for them. Pray for them. Speak life and start making powerful declarations over their lives, whether they believe it or not, whether they hear it or not. Call those things that are not as though they were. You all know what that means? That means look reality in the face and say, I choose to believe God in this. I don't just see my child okay. I see my child saved and serving God. Amen. That child, that child who stole that gum may one day become a preacher. 
And that child who tried to set that church on fire may spend the rest of his life trying to get the church on fire. So you... <laughs> Woo! Man, that got me happy right there. That was like... Every time I did something wrong, I got caught. And the worst part of getting caught <laughs> is not what you think. It was not the whipping. That was pretty bad. And my daddy still believed in whippings. There's no sound scarier than a belt coming out of a set of Levi's. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? It makes a distinct sound. You never forget about it. And when they say it's going to hurt me more than you, that's a lie. It's not. It's going to hurt me a lot more. Anyway, but the, the worst part of getting caught was that my dad would sit me down and we would have these long talks. Anybody else? Lord, I miss that. Long talks about life and morals and principles, integrity. Long talks about good and bad and right and wrong. My dad was the first one that taught me about the long-term implications of short-term decisions. That every decision that you make not only has a little short-term, but it has a long-term attached to it. And, but then after the talk, I would go back and I would just go back to doing what I knew was wrong. And so when I preach every year this series on legacy lessons, especially on something like this, on principles, it's important to me. Because I spent a lot of my young life trampling on those principles. I spent a lot of my time walking all over them, not obeying my father, and paying a higher and higher price every time I disobeyed what he told me. Until eventually, and I've told you all this many times, I ended up being expelled from school in the first semester of the 11th grade. In the first semester of the 11th grade, they didn't just suspend me, they threw me out. Don't ever come back. And it made me so mad that my life spiraled out of control. And six months later, I was arrested by the St. Augustine City Police Department with seven charges in one night at one time. And it got real when they locked me in that holding cell in the city police station. Clang! The door closed. It got real when I had to go and sit in front of a judge and explain myself to him. My dad went with me because he was a man of principle, but he demanded that I handle it myself. A principle. A principle is an accepted rule of conduct. A principle is a fundamental truth. Principles are the moral compass of your life that governs your words, your thoughts, and your behaviors. That's what a principle is. A principle is a conviction that you have that is rooted in your belief system. Therefore, it has a tremendously deep meaning to you as the person that holds it. It never has to be popular. I'm going to say that again. It never has to be popular. It never has to be accepted by anybody else. That might be the standard of behavior that you live by or that you hold yourself to. It doesn't have to be popular. It doesn't have to be accepted by anybody else. It doesn't even have to be understood by them. Anybody else? It don't have to be understood by them. Sometimes when your kids come up to you and they say, oh, well, them down the street, they let their boy do it. I don't care what they do down the street. This is what we do in this place. It doesn't even have to have anyone else's endorsement. You don't have to have a crowd come alongside you and reinforce the fact that your convictions are right. It doesn't have to have their endorsement. In fact, many times it won't. But once it is established, it governs the conduct of your life, even when no one is watching it. That's what your principles are. They govern the standard of your conduct, even when no one is watching and there's no way you'll ever get found out. Don't ever believe that lie because be sure your sins will find you out. The story of Moses, I want, I'm going to preach a little bit this morning. The story of Moses is one of the most recognized in all of the Bible. Every moment of his life is iconic. I love the story of Moses. The first 40 years of his life lived in the palace of Pharaoh. He was raised in the lap of luxury. 
educated in the best schools, eating the best food. He had life by the tail. Everything was good. He was recognized. He was known. He was Moses. But at some point he looked out and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and his temper flared and Moses went and he killed that Egyptian and it was discovered and he was branded as a murderer. And so to save his own life, he ran off. And in the next 40 years of his life, he becomes a shepherd, anonymous in the deserts of Midian of all places, which is the backside of the desert. It is nowhere until the day that he encounters God at the burning bush at the age of 80. <laughs> at the age of 80, he encounters God at a burning bush and God orchestrates to send him to lead the people out of Egypt. He goes in there and delivers the words, let my people go. And then when Pharaoh's heart is hardened, he uses Moses to bring the plagues upon Egypt, the frogs, the flies, the lice, the rivers turned to blood, and, and all of that, which all culminated in the moment when he led the people out. And he set them on course to the promised land, which we sometimes forget that is, is where the Hebrew people still abide today. It all, it all started with Moses. The reason that they have the place that they have is because God sent Moses to set them free, to lead them there and set them in that land. But none of that would have ever happened if it were not for these women and this moment who were willing, listen to me, to disobey a Pharaoh you follow me? To disobey a Pharaoh because they wouldn't kill the innocent. They were willing to die if need be because they were standing on a principle that we will not, we will not kill the innocent. We will not, for convenience, we will not, for culture, we will not, for you, we will not kill the innocents. And this is an incredible moment of courage because Principle often yields to power. I am. Principle often yields to power. One of the reasons the Bible is as important as it is is because it is the ultimate revelation of absolute truth. Principle and the standards of conduct that an almighty God has given to us that govern our lives and govern how we're supposed to live our lives. When people disdain the Bible, you are disdaining the governance that God gives us on how we're supposed to live our lives and how we're supposed to obey and how we're supposed to live. It's, it is, listen, it is never meant to stifle us. Some people say, you know, I just don't know. I can't, the Bible has got too many rules in it. I can't. It's never meant to stifle you. The exact opposite is true. It is given by God to us to actually set you free. Because as you live out, amen, as you live out the principles of God, you set into motion this process of supernatural intervention in your life. As you stand on the principles of God, you set into motion the fact that He will be there with you and for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? You have this ultimate promise of God to be with you and to sustain you in every moment. Going back to Sunday school, the story of Daniel is a story of a man making a choice. Despite the circumstances, despite the consequences, when he was taken into slavery, they said, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to eat the same thing that everybody else is going to eat. And the Bible says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not eat the portion of the king's meat. That's a principle. Daniel said, we're just, we're just not going to do it. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego isn't just a cute little story of guys in a fiery furnace. It is a story of men standing up for what is right. When everyone else said, we're just going to take the easy way out, they said, we will not bow. Even if that means going into the furnace, we won't do it. The story of Joseph. The Old Testament story of Joseph is the story of a man who would do what was right. <laughs> Not just because it was good, but because of his devotion to God. Are you all with me? And so when Potiphar's wife came along and said, hey, 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 he didn't say, you know, not today. You know, I, I'm, I don't want to get caught. You know, if I get caught, it's going to be ugly. He just said straight out, I, how can I do this thing and sin against God? What is that? That's a man standing on a principle. Even in the face of pleasure. I preach sermons like this. 
Because we are living in a time when we glorify everything but principles. If y'all don't know that, you're not paying attention to the culture that you're being raised in. You sometimes wonder how can your children and grandchildren be so unprincipled? It's because they are besieged in a culture that has no regard for principles. I'm going to preach before y'all say anything. The gods of our day are pleasure and entertainment and convenience and immorality. The gods of our day are comfort, conformity, compliance, and compromise. Those are the gods of our... Y'all ain't saying nothing. Those are the gods of this day. And so when someone comes along and does live out a principle, the script has been flipped so badly that now it's laughed at. There'll be somebody that'll hear this sermon and laugh about it. Principles. Brothers and sisters, we live in a day when we laugh at patriotism. I'm sick of it. We live in a day when we laugh at principle. I've seen it. I've seen soldiers in uniform mocked and ridiculed by somebody who thought that they were ridiculous to give their life over a country. We laugh at people who are honest and responsible and trustworthy. We laugh at them. Y'all have seen it at work. Somebody comes along and they say, well, they want them to do something at their workplace. And they say, well, that's not my responsibility. That's not my job. Let them do it. That ain't my job. Well, that's why you'll never own the company. Huh? Don't want to offend anybody, but I hope you like wearing a shirt with your name on it because that's all you're ever going to do. And people say, people say, nobody lives like that anymore. I do. I do. I would hope that I had a few folks in here that feel the same way. I want to tell you, I do, and I know I'm not the only one. And as we drift further and further away from the principles that we once knew, I believe that there was an upswell of longing in people's hearts for a return to what we had before we got all this. Amen? Man, don't even talk to me. I spent a lot of my time the last few weeks thinking about my mom and dad. There were literally (laughs) thousands of... And thousands of lessons. Don't lie. Don't lie. It's so passe these days. Don't cheat. Don't cheat, son. Just don't cheat. Don't steal. (laughs) My dad, the night I got caught stealing a pack of gum, FYI, he turned the truck around on A1A. And we went right back to the handyway. And he marched his little eight-year-old boy right up to that counter. And I had to apologize for stealing the gum. I had to give back what was left. At least I could have kept it. He made me give back what was left. He put me in the truck. We went home and we had a little talk after the whipping. Don't make excuses. Always do your best to keep your word. If you're not going to keep your word, don't say it. But once you said it, that's it. That's it. If it hair lips the devil, you're going to keep your word. Don't be lazy. I don't know how many times my father said, son, don't be lazy. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. So shall poverty come upon you. And the thing that I didn't see at the time is that they never stopped teaching and they never stopped standing. Every time I broke a rule, I got caught. And every time, good God, they would teach again. We don't lie because it says in God's word, we don't lie. And bigger than that, the legacy lesson is that if you continue to lie at some point, no one will be able to believe you. And then one day you'll be telling the truth and everybody will say, man, he's a liar. There ain't nobody reason to listen to him. If I had the reputation as a liar, I wouldn't be able to stand up here and tell you anything because you would always be thinking that's not true. We don't steal Because God's word says we don't steal and you earn your own way. Legacy lessons, they never stop standing on those principles and I hated it, I hated it, I hated it. But now I understand that I am the man who I am today because they prayed, they taught, and they stood. The legacy lesson for today is to stand on a principle. In an increasingly unprincipled society, you have to be willing to stand. And sometimes you will stand all by yourself. 
If you want to be accepted, just give up now. Sometimes you will stand all by yourself, and sometimes all it takes is one. Sometimes that's all it takes is just one. Somebody somewhere is just looking for one person to have the courage to stand on their principles, and they'll jump right in there with you. Or even if they don't jump in with you, then that'll embolden them to stand up for their principles. Okay, I told you that I was going to tell you what turned me around. I remember the exact moment of all of it. I remembered, I remembered, how much do I say? We got a few minutes. Is that all right? Can I tell you all? I, I, I remember going to Mario and Chickie's and drinking and playing pool. In St. Augustine at 16 years old, back in the day, you could drink. And if you wanted to drink, you went to Mario and Chickie's. They'd serve anybody. So we had a few beers. We got in the car. We raced across the bridge of lines. City police got us, stopped us. Here we go. Um, I, remember, I remember the door closing on the holding cell. I remember getting in the truck with Dad to drive home. I remember having to arrange all of the, the, the court and everything. My dad, it, it emptied my savings. When I turned 14 years old, I had about $1,600 in my savings account from working my tail off at Marineland. And my dad made me pay every fee by myself. I saw my, my savings account just drain and drain and drain and drain and drain. Well, my dad was well known in St. Augustine, and so he hired Hamilton Upchurch to be my lawyer. Um, if you're a St. Augustine person, uh, you know that Hamilton Upchurch is one of the most upstanding citizens of our county. He eventually became a state representative. He was a man of great integrity. He was a wonderful guy. And I remember the day I went to court. I went to court, and I was in a room with three men. Hamilton Up Church was on my left, my lawyer. My dad was on my right. And I was sitting in front of Richard Watson, Judge Richard Watson, who was another one. There are buildings in this town named after these men. There are buildings named after Richard Watson. There are buildings named after Hamilton Up Church. There's no building named after my dad, but his legacy is secure. And I remember sitting in that room, and I realized... At 16, that I was in the presence of honor. I was in the presence of honorable men. And I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed that I had humiliated my father in my name. I was so ashamed that I had to sit in front of these two honorable men and admit to what I had done. I, was, I had never been so ashamed in my life. That was the moment that it turned around for me. And I made a decision that day, I'll never do that again. I will never do that again. I will never be the go-along guy. I don't care who it is. I don't care what happens because I know what going along gets you. That's what it got me. It got me broke. It got me embarrassed. It got me arrested. I know how it feels. And I made the decision right then to never do it again. God is my witness from that day to now. I've, I've tried to live that out. So legacy lessons, standing on a principle. Old people, older, forgive me, older people. <laughs> I'm with you all, so don't look at me funny. Older people, teach. Teach. Teach and teach again. Continue to teach, continue to say it, and even when they're... They're in their room and they slam the door and they don't want to hear another word out of you. Continue to teach. Pray. Pray for them. Pray and believe that no matter what, God still is God and He has a plan for their life. He has a plan that is greater than your plan for them. He has a plan for your life that is greater than your plan for yourself. So teach and pray. If no one is in the realm of your life like that. And somebody, somebody is going to, this is for somebody. If no one is in the realm of your life like that, seek out someone. Seek out someone who will. Seek out someone who will teach you those things. Seek out someone who has some honor and who has some integrity, who can put those lessons into your life. It's never too late. It's not too late even now. Amen. And lastly, this is it. Some of you are crowd followers. Maybe not so much the older folks, but 
No, let me change that. We're a bunch of pansies as we get older too. Older people are still following crowds. Am, am I right? So let me change the wording of that entire sentence. If you're a crowd follower, the time for crowd following has to come to an end. Amen. It has to come to an end. Don't follow a crowd. Don't follow a crowd just to follow a crowd. You need to know what is right. You need to know what is right for you. You need to know what God's Word says on a thing. And when you put your feet down on it, that's it. Heaven and earth can pass away, but God's Word is not going to pass away. You will stand on that principle, and God will stand right there with you. Amen? I, have, I, 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 truly, I truly believe every word of a sermon like that. And I'm praying that it will find good ground in your heart. Amen? Let me pray for you. Praise the Lord. It's not too late. It's never too late. Our country has not gone too far. The generations behind us, the generations there with us are not too far. God can turn everything around. Parents with little ones, grandparents with grandchildren, you see it, you see it, you see it. Call those things that are not as though they were. Make declarations, solid declarations over them every day. And whenever you have the chance, pass along that lesson. Pass along that principle that you have that made such a difference in your life. Such a little thing sometimes. It's a, son, you shouldn't speak to your parents like that. Honor your father and your mother that it may go well with you that your days may be long on the earth. God's not trying to restrict you. God's trying to bless you. Patriots. People laugh. But God doesn't. Because the scripture stands beside you. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You're standing on God's principle. It never has to be popular. It never has to be accepted. It never has to have anyone's endorsement. I'm praying that someone is hearing this this morning and it's lighting some kind of a fire deep down inside of your soul. Father, today in the name of Jesus, set a fire down in our souls, God, to obey you and obey your word. Father, relight the passion in some parent or grandparent's heart in here to do what is necessary, when it is necessary, all the time, every day. Father, let us come to the place where we eliminate distractions in our lives, where we don't just take time, but we make time. Father, give us a burden for the young. Give us the burden for the next. God, for somebody in here today who is, has a heart for following crowds, God, bring them into relationship with people that will lead them, help them in the right direction. Father, I pray today that this word find its way into our hearts. You know what? I'm not just going to pray for y'all. Y'all, if you would, with heads bowed and hearts open, and those of you that are watching online, pray right there where you are. God, perform this in my life. I, I, I just feel this. I've, I've told so many lies that now it, it's, a, it's a brand that people just don't believe what I say. It can change. It can change. Start today. Start walking and living in the truth. I've, I've cheated so many times that no one, no one believes that I have any integrity at all. Well, start walking this out. Day by day, little by little. It takes, it takes time. But Father, I pray that this would come to pass in this generation, in this church, among these people. Father, let us learn what it means to be people of principle. If you wouldn't mind, stand up on your feet this morning as I pray a blessing on you. Father, I pray that you would bless and keep. Hmm. Declarations. I'm going to let you go in just a moment, but declarations. There is, a, there is somebody, a parent or somebody in here who's hearing this. Your declarations over your child. People have laughed about what you've said. Because you're saying what you believe God for. And it may not look like that. At, even at this moment, it still doesn't look like that. Continue to make that declaration. I see my child saved and serving God. 
I see my child walking with God into destiny and making a difference in this world. I see my child fully functional. I see their life restored. I see it. I believe it. God, I declare it by faith. And as you declare those things and as you make those declarations, don't you let anything or anybody shake that. I'm praying for a parent in here this morning who's on your last nerve. I bless you. And I pray that that word from God would find its way into your heart. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. Your nights of sleeplessness are meant to be in the past. That God would work and God would deal in the lives of your children and their futures. Give it to God. Give it all to God and let Him do it. This morning I bless you. I pray that this word find its place into your heart. And everybody said in Jesus' name.